This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Liz Truss has been elected as the leader of the Conservative Party to succeed Boris Johnson as the new UK Prime Minister. But coming into office, she is inheriting a country in a crisis. What are the challenges facing the new Prime Minister? What is her vision for the country? And how will the new leader help shape the future of the United Kingdom and Europe? To discuss these issues and more, I'm joined today by Rick Denham, former White House correspondent for Business Week, Isabel Hilton, founder and senior advisor at China Dialogue, and Professor Ian Beck from the London School of, of Economics and Political Science. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qianduo. Welcome to the discussion. Uh, Yin, I will start with you. You know, tell us more about uh, Miss Truss now. You know, like how much do we know about her political philosophy as she is, you know, she is running the country starting from now, probably. Well, she has had a fluctuating political philosophy. I think it'd be fair to say because she, early in her political life, was a Liberal Democrat, which is a centrist party. Her parents are left wing. But she seemed to have reinvented herself as a relatively right of center conservative with a strong pro market orientation, probably quite uh, liberal on social policies, but notorious over the last few weeks for having changed her mind on so many things, including her pre previous support for remaining in the EU being turned into a strong pro Brexiteer. So it's hard to pin her down to a very precise political philosophy. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, speaking at the victory uh, you know, meeting uh, for the election, uh, she said, I will govern as a conservative, uh, quote here. So what does that mean? Uh, you know, she stressed very much of a, about being conservative and govern as a conservative. Well, uh, if, if you were to try to devise a, a printout of what a a conservative wants it's being pro-market, low taxes, probably in, in favour of individual liberty. So again, some of the things that I've already explained that trust is associated with. It's maybe trying to reduce the size of the welfare state, trying to reduce workers' rights compared with what have been put in place by Labour parties. So in, in many ways, a similar agenda to that with which uh, Margaret Thatcher came into power. The one big difference is that Liz Truss is, is suggesting she's going to be quite relaxed about the sustainability of the public finances, something Margaret Thatcher would, be, would have been very opposed to. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Rick, you know, like, you know, she is from the Boris Johnson government. I mean, how different is Truss from Boris Johnson? Uh, and also, you know, how does Washington uh, see uh, the new prime minister in the UK politics? Well, I think uh, Washington looks at her as uh, less erratic than Boris Johnson. I mean, Boris Johnson was someone who, uh, to use the metaphor, shot himself in the foot very often, uh, sometimes with his mouth, sometimes with his policies. Um, so I think that they, they see her uh, as, uh, as someone who is a more reliable partner. At the same time, um, her, her uh, views of Brexit and uh, relations with Europe are pretty frosty. Uh, and in fact, she's even uh, backpedaling on the agreements uh, with the EU about uh, Ireland and the Irish border. And so I think Washington has some worries about the internationalism uh, of her. But in, 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 ter in terms of, uh, of, of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the continuing war there, uh, I think that Washington will see her as a reliable uh, partner. Mm -hmm. Well, Ian, uh, we, you know, we'll talk more about that uh, relationship with the EU you know, over yeah. the Northern Ireland Protocol, obviously. Um, but uh, speak of uh, you know, her foreign policy or uh, policy towards the European nations, including the France. You know. uh, during the campaign, she said that you know, whether Fran Macron, the president of the France, is a friend or foe, the jury is out. What does that mean? I think we have to look at what happened during the campaign. It's very different from what will happen when she's governing. 
in the campaign, she was trying to persuade Conservative Party members that she was the right person to become leader of the party and hence Prime Minister. The Conservative Party members like somebody that is rude about France. Uh -huh. They like somebody who appears to stand up for British interests. But if you look at even the developments over the last couple of, couple of days, she's backtracking very much on some of the things she said during the campaign. And it wouldn't surprise me at all to find that some of her attitudes, some of her policies, and some of her attempts to make her way in the world are very different from what we heard over the last six weeks. It's a campaign rhetoric, and uh, then when uh, she walks the walk, it's a bit different from probably what uh, you know she talked the talk. Um, but anyway, uh, there are you know people understand this almost like uh, I, I would say that's a consensus. You know, uh, she inherited a, a country in crisis. I mean, how serious is the situation? There are multiple challenges obviously in, you know, you have the energy crisis, you have the cost of living issues, you have uh, people are talking about the breakdown of the national health services, things like that. Of course, COVID is still around. Uh, tell us how challenging a job that is, uh, maybe for the Prime Minister. Well, it's challenging in two respects. You, you, you correctly identified the things that are top of the list, which is the cost of living crisis and the problems in the national health service as a in the aftermath of COVID, because what's happened is that things like uh, routine surgery has seen a, a long extension of waiting lists, and there's a huge, huge backlog of problems of people not being treated in the way they would have expected. It's linked to a difficulty over the, the government's approach towards social care. And uh, you may have heard in, in other contexts of the fact that you have a lot of elderly patients blocking beds in hospital because there is not the social care provision for them to leave hospital and be taken into a far more uh, respectable and a correct environment, which is social care. So these, that the cost of living and health are the top of the list. But where she faces real challenges is that the list is long. There is the idea of how you, you cope with energy in future. That's going to take big investment. There are her promises to cut taxes as the way she thinks is going to stimulate growth. But that's going to be very hard, difficult to implement because tax cuts are never easy in a context of the difficulties in the public finances. You rightly mentioned the problems over the protocol in Northern Ireland. It's been her uh, initiative in government while foreign minister to try to stand up to the European Union and say this is not working, which it isn't. It really is not working. Let's find a solution. But she's doing it by saber rattling rather than putting forward credible proposals. So it's it's a very long list of things that have to be dealt with more or less from today. And uh, she will, almost as we speak, have been appointed by the Queen as Prime Minister and will be coming back to London to say, right, here's what I plan to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, Rick, uh, if you look at uh, you know, one of the challenges, of course, is uh, the key is the inflationary pressure, uh, not only for the UK, but uh, I would say for a lot of countries around the world, basically every country is being affected. You know, it's the only difference is the degree, right? But here is like we are talking about a double digit uh, inflation pressure, inflation, and it could go further, like a 13% or even 20% early next year, according to Goldman Sachs. Uh, so, yes. I mean, of course, other European countries are in a similar situation. What, what can we do right now, like uh, for the new prime minister, for the new government to, to say, you know, relieve the pressure for the people? This is a severe problem uh, because it, I mean, inflation is insidious in the way it cuts into the standard of living of people. But I, I have doubts that the economic plan that she has embraced is something that is designed for this. It's said that conservatives say that when the economy is bad, you cut taxes, and when the economy is good, you cut taxes. Uh, cutting taxes right now will only uh, cause some uh, fiscal problems uh, and problems with the, bu with, with the uh, British budget. I don't see how it will stimulate the economy. Um, and uh, really, the, the, I mean, the, the uncertainties here uh, weigh on the British economy. Uh, one is with, with, uh, with Brexit and, uh, and trade uh, has really cut into the uh, GDP of Britain. Uh, and, the, and the second is the, uh, the cold winter ahead and uh, Russian uh, supplies of natural gas causing uh, huge inflation. And uh, when, when I look at the world, uh, the United States on one end has inflation, but it's much lower 
uh, than Europe in general, and Britain is on the high end, and so I think it's going to really hurt, and it's, it's going to cause political problems for her, particularly among working class voters, uh, sort of the core of the uh, constituency that has kept the conservatives in power uh, over, over the past few years. Mm -hmm. Well, Rick, obviously uh, this inflationary pressure mostly comes from the energy prices which is skyrocketing and, and then it mm -hmm. has a lot to do with the Ukraine war and the Russia has said that they will basically cut entirely uh, the, the supply of uh, gas through the Nord Stream 1 until the Europeans lifted yeah. the sanctions. So that, that kind of situation will probably will linger on for some time to come. Right. I, 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 th I, th I think that uh, she, she's going to have severe uh, economic issues to deal with. And I, I, I think it will take more than uh, political rhetoric, more than nationalistic rhetoric or uh, talk of tax cuts uh, to fix things. And um, it's, really, it's really a challenge. She, I mean, she, she has a lot of experience in government, but in terms of economic policy, I think that's one of the areas where she, she's been more talk and less action. And so I, I, I really do think that she's going to have to think outside the box and think differently than her campaign rhetoric if she uh, wants to turn things around. Fighting inflation is a slow process and you usually only break the back of inflation uh, with a recession. And it looks like Britain is headed for a recession and it could be a deep recession. And so the pain could be uh, very, uh, very deep. Uh, which could really hurt politically, hurt the Tories uh, and their, their bid to, uh, to, to stay in power for, for years to come. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Isabel, welcome to the show. Uh, you know, of course, a lot of the price issue comes from the energy uh, the, or the shortage of energy. Uh, and, uh, you know, Ms. Trust's proposal for tackling the energy crisis would be to pursue more nuclear power and also allow fracking. Um, but that was described as, you know, quote, dangerously short-sighted. So it seems that's a controversial idea? Uh, it's a controversial and effective idea because um, what we have is a short-term crisis going into the winter and um, what her proposals, you, you're not going to build a nuclear power station in Britain in under 10 years, frankly. Um, and fracking is very complicated in the UK for a number of reasons, not least the density of population and the opposition of local communities. So this is not the United States. There, you know, potential, uh, there is potential for fracking, but it's very unlikely to be realized for political reasons. And what is frustrating for people who look at the energy situation is that all her responses so far have been on the supply side, whereas the most a rapid and effective policy is to work on the demand side and Britain has some of the leakiest and coldest housing in Europe and if you were to insulate that housing it would directly benefit the elderly, the poor, the people who need to keep warm. They don't need to keep warm by wasting energy, they need to keep warm by using energy efficiently and we've seen repeatedly conservative governments introduce programs to do exactly that and then cancel them. So I think that, you know, uh, promising fracking and nuclear power is not going to help uh, Liz Truss politically this winter in this emergency. And it's going to annoy anyone who takes a longer term view of the of the climate crisis, which, again, is a substantial part of the population. Well, indeed, it is, um, you know, like a contradictory uh, move. You know, you, you, on one hand, you want to deal with the climate change. On the other hand, uh, somehow we, we, we go back to rely on nuclear power and the fracking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people would probably, yeah, <laughs> disagree, <laughs> just like uh, Isabel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, if you look at the larger issue, uh, Ian, I mean, uh, c cutting taxes, the government will borrow, I mean, to function. Um, but then it's really about the confidence, whether the investors have the confidence in the UK policy, in the new government, and then you can borrow uh, you know, at a lower price, at a cheaper price. Uh, so what's, what's the prospect uh, for that kind of policy? Is cutting taxes popular with the British public? Well, in a word, yes. Nobody likes to pay taxes. So a, a promise of cutting taxes is going to appeal to voters. But it's the consequences of cutting taxes because the, the likelihood is that all the policies that Liz Truss has been talking about, plus the ideas of tax cuts, are going to accentuate the size of the deficit 
lead to more public debt, and that public debt will have to be financed. And the risk over a couple of years is that the cost of financing the public debt is going to increase because it's linked to inflation. And that means that a higher proportion of public expenditure will go on paying interest, not on providing public services, which is a, a recipe for dissent in, say, a year or two's time, which is when she's going to face the, the wider electorate of the British, British voters. There's also a risk that this leads to a generational split, because if you, if you rack up debt today, you're saying to future generations, you're going to have to service and repay that debt. So it suits older people who happen to be in the majority and those who selected Liz Truss as leader, but it doesn't suit the younger generation who are going to have to pay for it. So that, that plus the, the uncosted promises that she's been making, for example, to raise spending on defence from 2 to 3% of GDP, this talk this morning of her imposing a price cap in the energy market, which is a short-term good idea because it will both... Uh, ease the burden on the cost of living and cut the inflation rate, but it stores up problems for the future. It's, it's going to cost uh, tens, maybe even a hundred billion pounds, which will simply add to the debt. So she's, so she's walking a tightrope on public finances. It's, it's like uh, there's um, not, not many uh, good choices over there. Uh, Isabel, you know, uh, Ms. Truss is known uh, for her fondness uh, for um, the former Prime Minister uh, Margaret Thatcher. Uh, you know, she modeled herself on Thatcher, you know. Uh, so, of course, we know uh, Thatcher, uh, you know, her free market and small government. Uh, are we seeing that kind of tendency or, you know, inclination uh, for the new Prime Minister, Truss? Well, without being too cynical about our new Prime Minister, I think that she felt that um, putting on Margaret Thatcher's style and clothes and uh, appearing, you know, on a tank uh, would help her win the leadership contest. And we have to remember that the leadership contest was, the electorate in the leadership contest is a very small group of uh, probably the most conservative people in the country. Uh, these are Tory party members. This is not the electorate. If she were really, and they have an image of Margaret Thatcher, which is actually rather one dimensional because Margaret Thatcher was an able politician who was also rather pragmatic. She um, had a big hand, for example, in expanding the European Union. She was much in favor of broadening the European Union. Um, she was a very active, if often critical, member of the European Union. She was an important voice. So if Liz Truss really wants to follow Margaret Thatcher, she will, she will mend fences with Europe, she will be pragmatic in her economic policy, um, and she will manage to command her party. All of these things are rather in doubt, because all the only tests that we've had of, of Liz Truss's political ability so far have been within the narrow confines of her party, where she was not the choice of the parliamentary party, she was only the choice of the party in the country. And that is not a representative selection. Now she has to govern for the country. And I think that she will have to be more pragmatic. She's demonstrated that she can change her mind on really quite important things when she thinks it's useful to her. So I'm hoping that she might consider what's useful to the country and not govern as a, a narrow ideological right wing uh, faction because that's a sure way to lose the next election, for one thing, but also to do quite a lot of damage to the country in the meantime. Yeah, next election uh, in 2024, um, you know, with, with uh, the Labour Party, the opposition right now. Um, Isabel, you mentioned about, you know, she was elected by the Conservative Party members, the most conservative part uh, population, section of population in the country. Uh, for those who are outside the UK, who are not familiar, that familiar with the UK politics, tell us, like, uh, you know, being conservative, what does it mean, being conservative politically, economically? <laughs> Well, the, actually, that's a question that I think a lot of Conservative Party members would have some difficulty answering at the moment. Um, I mean, it used to be uh, the, the One Nation Tory idea. It was a bit like the German Christian Democrats. You know, it had a social conscience, um, but it was essentially a party that believed in free enterprise, rule of law and all those things. However, most of the One Nation, the senior One Nation Tories were expelled by Boris Johnson, who gave himself over to a much more radical, ideological, uh, right-wing uh, group, which has disproportionate power at the moment in the parliamentary party. So this is not the 
Conservative Party as it used to be even five years ago. This is a Conservative Party with with a hard core of ideology, which is considerable considerably to the right, I, I think, of, of most of the country. And I think it would be d quite difficult to test that out in a general election. But it has positions which are, for example, much more radically anti-China, um, much more nostalgic about a, a kind of Britain of of yesterday. Um, somebody, a friend of mine described it as the desire to build a better yesterday, which I think pretty much sums up that kind of nostalgia. And it doesn't really seem to address Britain's real problems in the world. Um, so that at the moment is what the Conservative Party looks like. And I'm not sure that this is a viable model, either for the problems that we're facing or, or for the electorate. I'm not sure that described that way, the electorate would go for it. It's had many years in power. Each mm -hmm. time they change leader, which has become rather frequent, they sort of pretend to be a fresh government, but it's the same party. You know, it is the same Conservative Party. So I think they're beginning to run out of steam myself. Mm -hmm. Well, Ian, uh, I'm not sure, do you agree uh, with uh, what Isabel has said? Uh, you know, but anyway, uh, she has to govern uh, differently from what she said, probably more pragmatic uh, to deal with that, the challenges uh, in terms of uh, governance. Yes, what, what Isabel said is very accurate. Uh, we've had two prime ministers. Oh, seems like we lost them. Yeah, the connection here. Uh, we have the latest that uh, Ms. Truss has been uh, appointed uh, to officially starting her term as a new prime minister of the UK. Um, but obviously, uh, Rick, I will turn to you here. I mean, external affairs uh, for the new government here. I mean, uh, close uh, to her probably, uh, I mean, she will make a decision probably whether uh, how to deal with the Northern uh, Ireland Protocol and uh, the uh, Van der Leyen, the European Commission president, uh, you know, in the congratulatory message, uh, she said, she also said that, uh, you know, we expect the UK to fully respect our agreements. <laughs> what's, what's the message here? So that's about uh, the protocol. Don't change, don't rewrite. Well, yes, ex exactly. I, Britain uh, left the European Union, negotiated a deal. Uh, the, I mean, Britain is suffering because economically it was a bad idea to leave the European Union and so uh, Liz Truss wants to renegotiate uh, the deal. Why should Europe uh, change it uh, just because there's pain for Britain? There's pain for Europe to have Britain out of the uh, European Union. So I mean, eventually pragmatism may prevail but it's a bad precedent for the European Union if every time uh, the British lion uh, roars, uh, they, they listen and they, they change. Uh, so I, I do think that that's, that's going to be very interesting uh, to watch and to see if she's more pragmatic. Remember, she was against Brexit uh, not too long ago. Uh, now she's the champion of Brexit. And I will be curious because that's a huge change in the Conservative Party. The Conservative Party under Margaret Thatcher uh, was really internationalist, mm -hmm. and, uh, and 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 the leadership uh, of the recent prime ministers was internationalist before uh, it came to Brexit. So uh, I, I'm curious to see what will, what will happen if we see pragmatism or if we see this uh, attempt at unilateralism without a lot of leverage behind her. No, without a lot of uh, leverage behind her. Uh, you know, how does Washington see this? Um, I know Washington is also concerned about uh, you know, whether the UK is going to rewrite this protocol or you know, how the UK is going to deal with the controversy with the EU. Uh, I mean, Washington, I, I think, would, would like to have uh, British attempts to change the Brexit deal go away uh, and, uh, and, and, and not to have tensions within the European alliance. I mean, J Joe Biden uh, and Vladimir Putin uh, have really rewritten uh, Europe because Europe has been more united over the past year, including Britain, uh, in response to the Russian aggression. And, uh, and I, don't, I think that Washington uh, at large, and the Biden administration in particular, would rather not have tensions that could possibly uh, divide Europe uh, with this cold winter coming up. I mean, there's going to be pressure uh, on, U on Ukraine to, to, uh, to, to give in some uh, so that Europe doesn't feel as much pain. And I think that Washington and the Biden administration uh, would prefer to try to figure out ways uh, to keep Europe uh, united, uh, to try to 
uh, resolve the situation in Ukraine rather than have Ukraine uh, surrender territory. Mm -hmm. Well, Ian is back. Uh, why don't you continue, Ian? I think I was, I was answering your question about uh, how Liz Truss would govern. The big challenge that she's facing is that her predecessor was a very effective campaigner, managed to get himself elected, but in the end governed badly. The major challenge, therefore, for Liz Truss is to reverse that. She's not the greatest of campaigners, even though she's just won a, a selection rather than an election. She needs to govern effectively because there were so many things going wrong in the British system. I mentioned earlier the healthcare problems. There is the, there's been problems in, of the integrity of politicians. All of that has to be reversed. And if she doesn't achieve that, then she's going to go down as yet another failed Conservative Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, Isabel, uh, earlier you mentioned China, of course, you know, uh, China is the third largest trading partner with the UK and the Ms. Truss, uh, during the campaign, uh, did talk uh, quite uh, on a few occasions, uh, tough, I would say, on China, you know, she uh, said that uh, she will review the uh, uh, foreign policy and the defense strategy and probably will, uh, will, will list China as uh, a threat to UK national security. Uh, so how likely she would do that and what does that mean to, you know, how will that kind of listing affect these bilateral relations? Well, if she were to do that, it would obviously, China would obviously have to react in, in some way. Now, China has many ways of responding to a situation like that, including, for example, our university sector has a very, very high proportion of Chinese students. If they were no longer to come, we would have to fund our university sector differently. We have a lot of investment from China. We have trade relations with China. Um, so, you know, China doesn't have to declare Britain an enemy, it just has to tighten the screws a bit. And Liz Truss, with all the problems that she's facing in the British economy, would certainly feel that. So my view of this is that it's something she says on the campaign trail, because there is a group within the party that is taking uh, very much its direction from a, a very hardline approach in Washington. And there is, as you know, a close connection between um, certain political elements in the UK and in Washington. Um, but the, when she pauses and reflects on the, the damage that this might do at a time when Britain has many, many other problems, I don't think it's going to be very high on her agenda. If I were an incoming prime minister, this is not really the moment I would choose to pick a fight with China, to be honest. It's not a priority. There are there are much bigger priorities. Mm -hmm. What she will do, though, um, I think, is align herself with, you know, a more robust line that the European Union, for example, is also taking on China, and and to a certain extent, there will be there will be overlap in certain uh, U.S. Uh, uh, policies. So I don't think Britain will dissent from those, but I don't think Britain will be out in front either. I think there may be some, there are some things she can do which actually I think would be quite beneficial. There is, for example, the question of the Confucius Institutes which are on British university campuses. And I think whilst some, there are some elements that want to close them down entirely, I think a better solution is to move them onto the high street. After all, the French Institute and the Goethe Institute, and these are the cultural institutes of our closest allies, they're on the high street like the British Council is around the world. And and I don't see any harm in China's Cultural Institute, you know, being on the high street with those. And I think that would defuse some of the tensions that have arisen on the campus, whilst maintaining a very important cultural window into China and, and, and mutually a mutual cultural window, which I think in these times of geopolitical tension, we really do need to maintain if we can. Well, uh, with that, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thank you for being with us. See you next time. <laughs>